All conflict is, is one or more people are not getting their needs met. But if we're responsible, if we're good communicators, if we engage the situation as partners and not adversarial, and at the end of the conversation, everybody is getting their needs met, well, then conflict isn't necessarily bad. It can actually be a good thing as long as we all approach it appropriately and we approach it professionally. So that's what I really want to talk about today is kind of how to have those difficult conversations so that at the end of the conversation or at the end of the, the conflict that it was handled appropriately and everybody is getting their needs met. The other thing is, and this is kind of my, what, what I hope to be kind of a little extra bonus for you, is that the, the skills that hopefully we can learn over the next 45 minutes, give or take, they're not just applicable to your workplace environment, but they're applicable kind of across the board. So this is something that you can do with friends. It's things that you can do uh, with family. It's basically, it's about being human and uh, humans have conflict with one another. And I literally, just a few days ago, used the skills that I'm going to introduce to you now to get a discount on my cable bill. So really, I can save you money if we just do it this way, okay? So how do we have these difficult conversations. There's three steps um, to having these conversations. Uh, the first is that we need to determine whether or not this is a conversation that actually needs to happen. Uh, secondly, we'll prepare for the conversation. And then third, we'll have the conversation. And it would not surprise me one bit if every one of you was looking at your screen right now and saying, yeah, yeah, that, that's how they do it. They, they put some simple stuff up on the screen and they expect it just to kind of just kind of work. It's kind of like I said, I'm going to teach you how to fly a plane. All you got to do is one, get in the plane, two, go into the cockpit, and then three, just, just fly that plane. And you're like, okay, thanks. That's, uh, that's, I'm going to need a little bit more than that. So what I'm hoping is that we're going to go through each one of these seemingly simple steps and kind of break them down. And I'll even do things like give you kind of sentence stems that you can utilize when you're going into these conversations that, that will hopefully help you quote unquote fly the plane. So the first, does this conversation need to happen? And it's, this is a little bit tougher than maybe we might think right at the front end which is you say, well, of course it needs to happen. I am upset about something, or of course it needs to happen. Something uh, occurred that, that maybe Matt. And what I want to remind everybody is that, so we're at work for, you know, 40 hours a week, give or take. Um, um, we, we, we are in with our families 40 hours a week where we do all these things and everything that we do in life has an impact on everything else that we do in life. And it's always really hard and I would say maybe even impossible for us to always compartmentalize every aspect of our lives. And so sometimes what might happen is, is you're having a tough time at home. Um, you are having an argument with your partner, maybe, or your, your kids are um, uh, made you mad this morning, or you skipped breakfast, your dog had an accident, you had to clean up, any number of things. But we carry with us all the stuff in our daily lives, everywhere we kind of go. And so it wouldn't be uncommon, for example, that you come to work and there's other things that are, that are, that are applying pressures to you and then something happens and you're like, that's it, I gotta do something about that right now. And it may be that what happened at work isn't actually the kind of root cause of your frustration, but it might be other things as well. But we react emotionally in the moment and then come, you know, a day, two days, a week later, and we're like, you know, I really wish that if I had just taken a moment, I could have kind of maybe avoided the whole situation by just taking a breath and thinking through it. So the first thing I want to invite all of us to do is to ask ourselves, is this a conversation that needs to happen? Or are my frustrations or whatever it might be um, rooted elsewhere? Or even if they're not, even if they are rooted in something that's happening at the job, is it a one-time thing or is it a kind of a pattern? And so th these are some of the questions that um, I would like for us to ask, which is we say, okay, so situation X has occurred or, or this, this, this um, issue has come up that I want to talk about. And we say, okay, so first, does this fall outside of my job description? 
And I would encourage everybody, when you want to have these kinds of conversations with your colleagues or your supervisors, do familiarize yourself with what are what is my job description? What are the expectations set forth for me to do? Because sometimes I've had, um, just in my, in my career, not necessarily at Lone Star, but across the board, I've had people come to me and say, well, that's not my job, or that's not what I'm I'm supposed to do that's not what this position does and i'm like are you sure and then we kind of go back and look at the job description and come you know lo and behold oh my mistake that this is actually something that is expected of me uh furthermore i'm going to when we get to the second step i'm going to ask for y'all to kind of be sure we've got our documentation and stuff like that in, a, in, uh, in order so it's good to always familiar familiarize yourself with the job description so that when you're talking to your supervisor you're prepared you can say, these are the expectations uh, that are set forth for me. Then we can ask ourselves, is this a one-time event or is it a pattern? So it is impossible for anybody to go through their career or their, their job or their anything that goes on in life and not have there be events that are going to occur that can be um, you know, upsetting or be something that you wish hadn't happened or whatever it might be. Um, but the first thing, ask ourselves, is this a pattern that I'm seeing to where I don't want to kind of deal with this on a daily basis, or is it, maybe it's a one-time event and then it never happens again? Because I'll also remind you, just like I was saying earlier, we carry all of our, everything with us all day, every day. That's true for everybody else as well. So it might be that one of your colleagues or somebody they were just having a bad day themselves and maybe they weren't as nice as they usually are and uh, they snap at somebody. I'm not trying to forgive that behavior, but is it a one-time event or is this a pattern of how somebody behaves? What, even if it is a one-time event, even a one-time event can be worthy of having these kinds of discussions and so on because you know it's there's difference between um, the, the tone of my voice being a little bit a little bit not as nice as it usually is versus stepping over a line that is inappropriate and then it becomes egregious so we can ask ourselves those kinds of questions as well that let's not forgive something that occurred as a one-time event just because it was a one-time event because there are certainly one-time events that necessitate action um, so but these are the kinds of things that i want to start um, thinking about it if it's urgent we need to deal with it in the moment however if it's not urgent there are some things to consider as we move forward to have these kind of difficult conversations. And the first thing I want to talk about are procedures versus norms. So procedures are things that are kind of set and written down. And here's the way we go about doing things um, in, in a procedural manner. Norms are things that occur organically in an institution and just kind of become the way that we co that we go about doing things. Um, and norms are extremely powerful, but we don't always know norms because they're not written down, because you kind of learn norms by just watching and observing. But especially if you might be new to a position or if you like moved offices or something like that, you may not familiarize yourself with the norms. I remember one of the first jobs that I had out of college, um, it was an eight to five uh, office kind of gig. And so I would go in, you know, at eight o'clock and then at five o'clock, I pack my things up and off I would go. And after a couple of weeks, I noticed that at five o'clock when I was done and the workday was over and I was packing all my stuff up, I was the only one who was leaving. And so, you know, I kind of made friends with one of the other, the other folks who were working there. And I went to him one day and I was like, hey, we're off at five, right? And he's like, uh, well, yeah. And I was like, okay, because... Every day at five, I pack my stuff up and I, and I kind of go, but I've noticed that I'm kind of the only one doing that. He's like, yeah, yeah, we noticed that too. It's like, okay, you want to you wanna help me out? You want to kind of give me some insight into what's going on? He's like, well, I mean, technically we're off at five, but we don't really do that. Um, what we do is we wait until the boss leaves. And then when the boss leaves, we all leave. And that... That is not what was written down, but that was what the norm was in this particular office. And so what um, what almost certainly had happened was probably, you know, some years back, 
somebody was wanting a promotion or something like this. And they said, I'm going to show myself to be a hard worker. I'm not leaving until the boss does. And they started sticking around. And somebody else saw that and they said, no, no, no. You're not going to get that promotion over me. If you're going to stick around, I'm going to stick around too. And then suddenly everybody kind of started doing it. And that just became the norm for the office. But when I came in and I was trained, they said, leave at five. I said, cool. And I left at five because nobody teaches like norms are things that you that aren't written down, right? They're just kind of things that you'll learn and you, you uh, through observation will kind of come to know it. So sometimes what you might see as being something that was, you're like, I had an expectation of X, Y, and Z was going to happen. And then when X, Y, and Z doesn't happen, it might be because over time, norms have emerged that have changed. And if you can have conversations, you might be able to realize these things because there's institutional evolution that expectations, positions, and all these things may have changed. What that might mean is that we might need to do things like revisit the job description because that job description might be 30, 35 years old and no longer represents what actually is the job anymore. And so when we kind of start to have these conversations, if you're armed with knowledge about norms, if you're armed with knowledge about procedures and all these kinds of things, then it can make going into the conversation a lot easier and a lot better, okay? So the first thing I want us to ask ourselves is does this conversation actually need to happen? Let's assume for a moment that it does, um, because otherwise uh, I'm done and I still don't have 30 minutes to talk to y'all. So let's pretend like this actually does need to occur, okay? So the next step is we want to prepare for the conversation. And the first thing I want to say is give yourself enough time to remove emotion from the equation. So my assumption is that if you want to have a, a difficult conversation with your supervisor, there's probably been one or a pattern or one or more things that's kind of been going on that has made this situation uh, uncomfortable. And it's made it to where you are going home. You might be, com you know, complaining to your partner about, you know, I can't believe or this or that is happening. I can't believe, you know, I'm so mad. I just don't even want to go in anymore I'm, I'm, or whatever it might be. If you go into a conversation that's already difficult and it's emotionally charged for you, a lot of things can happen. One is that you can fail to have kind of focus when you're talking about the situation. And when you fail to have focus, that makes it more difficult to be able to resolve the situation from like the supervisor's point of view, because it, you might be kind of all over the board, right? Uh, also, when, when things are emotionally charged, you can, when you start talking, you can kind of tend to go off on, not, I don't mean, when I say you, I don't mean you personally, I mean the universal you, myself included, that when I am emotionally charged about something, I'll say something which will remind me of something else. And next thing you know, I've got five or six tangents going all at once. And so what you want to do is you want to remove emotion and go in and just be ready to be kind of factual with the information and explain kind of what's going on. Also, I would recommend setting up a meeting. I've watched far too many people do that. Um, so while I've got you here, let me talk to you about X, Y, or Z. And I don't recommend doing that. Uh, the reason, there's, there's several reasons why I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, the first reason why is if you do the, while I've got you here, it already kind of undermines and undercuts the importance of the issue in the other person's mind because it almost seems like, uh, oh yeah, by the way, this is something that I'd like to kind of tack on in addition to whatever it was we were talking about uh, otherwise. And if this is an issue that is truly disturbing or truly upsetting to you, don't undermine it. it give it the, the, nece the necessary resolve that it, it requires and demands. Further, you don't always know what their schedule looks like. Actually, some of y'all do scheduling, so that's, you do know exactly what their schedule looks like, but not all of us. And so you might not know what their schedule looks like. And I don't want to try to take something that might take 15, 20, 30 minutes but they've only got five to give me. And now suddenly I'm trying to rush through an issue that, and it doesn't get the time that it, that it needs. So if I actually set up a meeting, it tells my supervisor or my colleague or whatever whom I'm having this conversation, one, 
this is important to me. And it's something that necessitates a sit down discussion so we can kind of work through this. Second, it also ensures that enough time has been set aside to actually, if not resolve the issue, at least get the wheels in motions to try to, to, do, to begin to resolve that issue. So set aside 30 minutes, 45 minutes, however long it is, um, uh, and they can, they can give to be able to truly resolve the issue. Also, um, prepare notes and documentation. Um, so when we get to the next step, you're gonna, you'll find that I'll say, well, we'll talk about kind of how to describe what the problem looks like. When I say documentation, I really just mean, um, I don't mean like necessarily it has to be notarized by it or anything like that. But a lot of times I'll have conversations with folks about this or other things. And they'll say, they'll, they'll say, I've had to do X, Y, and Z. And I'll say, okay, I, I will, I kind of accept you, your statement at face value. Can you give me an example? Can you give me an example or multiple examples of when this has occurred? And now suddenly they're struggling to kind of come up with the, with an example of what it is that they've said has been happening. And it's much, much more compelling to the, to the person you're talking to if you can actually say, yes, I can give you examples. So kind of whatever the situation or issue is, try to have examples of when those things have occurred. And to have, them, to have notes for your discussion is not a bad thing. Um, anticipate questions that their supervisor or your colleague might have, like, when, uh, can you give me examples of when that's happened? Or, um, okay, I understand that that occurred. Why do you believe that's not in your job description? Um, why? Uh, and, and sometimes it's things like, for example, job descriptions will often have a line similar to something like other duties as assigned or, or some kind of like broad statement like that. And so you'll say, I don't believe in my job description I should be expected to do X, Y, or Z. And they might say, cool, why is that not just other duties as a sign? So anticipate questions like that. So then you can explain to them why that's the case, or you can at least have, begin the conversation as to why you think that's not the case. So anticipate questions that they might have. I also recommend practicing the conversation with somebody that you trust. Um, so, you know, friend, uh, colleague, um, um, uh, romantic partner, somebody, a family member, something like that, and just kind of explain the situation to them. And I would recommend that you ask them to behave in a manner that you think is going to be the most difficult for you to kind of deal with. So that way you're like, um, you know, I think my boss is pretty cool. I think that they'll be able to be um, um, cooperative in this, we'll be able to come to it, but I want to practice as though it's not. So let me practice that way. Let's pretend as though they're not going to be receptive to my message. So that way, if you can practice it that way, when it comes to actually having the, the conversation, if it goes awesome, then you feel great. It also increases your confidence because you say, I've already practiced what happens if this is not a conversation where the other person is always um, uh, cooperative or what it might be. So get to practice many different kind of paths that the conversation might follow. So you feel confident going into it. I practiced all the different paths. And the last one is don't always assume an adversarial relationship. A lot of times I've had people say when I've, i because i i coach people through these kinds of conversations i've done mediated um conflict and, and a lot of things like this and a lot of times people come in assuming it's adversarial that i have to quote unquote beat the other person or, or whatever it might be and i would say that 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 can be the case and I, i'm not going to say it's never the case of course it can be the case but i'll say that more often than not it's probably not set up that way, which is to say, in general, humans like to get along with other humans. That's just kind of the way we're wired, uh, especially if you have to work with somebody on a consistent basis. We kind of want things to be able to go smoothly because nobody wants to go into work and have a sit and have an office environment where people are unhappy. Uh, and that's true from 
um, every angle of kind of in, the, in that office relationship. So if you said, say to your supervisor that something is upsetting or that you uh, are having difficulty with an issue or whatever it might be, my assumption is that a lot of the time they're going to want to help. And if anything, are going to be what you what you perceived before to be adversarial was maybe them just not knowing or not, or even if they knew about the situation, didn't think it was as big a deal as you think it might be. So when you explain to them why it's a problem or why it's an issue, then that's what you believe to be adversarial actually can become cooperative pretty quickly. However, if you go into the con into the, the, the conversation with the approach that it's adversarial and you come in with the approach that you are going to quote unquote win through attacking or aggression, people will respond in kind. So what might have started, what, what could have been a cooperative relationship ends up being an aggressive adversarial relationship because of the way that you approached it from the word go, which gets us to fly in the plane. How do we do this? Okay, so these are step-by-step -step, um, things that you can do and say that tend to get the best response. So I had a whole lot of caveats there. So let me kind of, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this, let me just, let me break this down. This is not um, a silver bullet or a golden ticket. Uh, it's not necessarily going to work in every single uh, situation. This does presume that the other person wants to be engaging and wants to resolve the conflict appropriately. And we all know that there are certain people out there who aren't like that. I would say that's the exception to the rule, that more often than not, people want to be cooperative. People want to resolve conflict appropriately. They want to do all those things. And that this structure gives you the best opportunity for that conflict to be resolved appropriately. But don't think that if you do this, it's magically always going to work because the reality is it, it won't necessarily. What I am going to tell you is this is the structure that the research says gives you the best opportunity for an outcome that is best for everybody. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the structure you want to follow. And it's one, two, three, and four. And we have to do these things in order because... Two doesn't work without one, three doesn't work without two, and so on. So actually, you'll have to do these things in order. And when I said bring notes, kind of prep for the meeting and do those things, literally, I think that you should sit down and kind of write out some of these things. Because if, if this isn't second nature to you, if you don't do a lot of conflict mediation or a lot of conflict resolution, this stuff might seem kind of... Um, weird so go ahead and write it down and that's perfectly fine i don't think that anybody is going to be upset with you if you come in and have some some things written down uh, you can even if you want begin the conversation by saying uh, i want to be sure uh, say this is an emotional issue for me so i want to be sure that i stay on track so i've written a few things down i hope that's cool and the answer is almost certainly going to be yeah of course no problem so the first thing you want to do is you want to describe and be descriptive about the issue, event, or whatever it is that is um, uh, the problem. You want to use I language instead of you language, and I'll talk about what that means in just a second, and describe everything in objective terms. So when I say objective terms, that's things that you can point to. You can, you can literally say, like, you can point to it, right? I see this, I think this, I feel this, I believe this. As a, that's, that, that's the I language. I see, I think, I feel, I believe, and so on. That's preferable to you language. You language is you are this, you are that, and so on. Um, also, if you're going to your supervisor because you're having a problem with a, a coworker or a colleague or something like that, we can replace you with the name of the other person. And that's just as problematic. So you never, basically what this is saying, when I say use I language as opposed to you language, you're doing two things. The first thing you're doing is you're owning it as opposed to pushing the blame off of, on somebody else. 
And you're also not giving the other person the opportunity to kind of say no. So for example, um, um, let's assume, for example, that you have asked your daughter to do the dishes. I, I'm not, I'm not speaking from personal experience right now. I'm not mad about the fact that I asked my daughter to do the dishes last night and she didn't do them. And currently there's a kitchen full of dirty dishes. I'm not bringing my own personal life into it. This is just a random example. Okay. So let's just quit, quit judging me. Uh, if I were to say, or you were to say to your daughter, um, you are so lazy because you didn't do the dishes. A couple things. So you are so lazy. That's that you language, right? The first thing is they're almost certainly going to be defensive immediately because you attack them, right? You're so lazy. They're going to become defensive and that's going to escalate the situation as opposed to de-escalate the situation, which is what we're looking for. Also, they're going to deny probably what you have just said. So if I say you're so lazy, she's going to say, no, I'm not. And then she might even attack back. And let me tell you something about you. And off we go, right? Whereas if I say I language, one, they don't feel attacked because I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about me. And they also can't deny it. If I say you're so lazy, they can't say, no, I'm not. And by the way, that's fair, right? You can't crawl inside somebody's head, know them and, and say, but if I say, I see that there are dishes piled up in the sink. No, they're not. I can point to them, right? <laughs> yes, there are. See, right there. There they are. So when you are objective, when you describe things, it denies the other person the opportunity to say no or to say that's not the what's gone. That's not what's happened. That's not whatever it might be. And especially if you own feelings, it, it, that short circuits their ability to say no as well, right? If you say, I am underappreciated, they can say, no, you're not. We, appreci we appreciate you. But if you say, I feel underappreciated, they can't really say, no, you don't feel that way. Like, well, you, you can't tell me how I feel. Like, that, that's how I feel. Make sense? So when you claim ownership over these things, I feel this way, I believe this, I perceive this, then it opens up the opportunity for discussion because there can't be an instant denial of them, okay? But you want to look at everything in objective terms, things that you can point to. Second, explain why the situation is problematic for you. So if there's not a, if this isn't a problem, then why are we sitting down for a 30 minute meeting or whatever? So you describe the event in objective terms. Then you explain why it's troublesome or, or problematic for you. And again, put the put put this in objective terms as well. Then you want to articulate your wants and needs. So there's something very kind of, of key here. A lot of times we think about wants or needs as actions, but wants and needs aren't actions their wants or needs. Actions can be mutually exclusive. And when I say mutually exclusive, I mean two actions can't exist at the same time. Wants and needs are rarely mutually exclusive. But if you frame your wants and needs as an action, as opposed to a want or a need, which is what they are, then that can cause problems in trying to figure out the solution to the problem. So for example, I have a dog. Um, she's in here with me right now, and she has been such a good girl. She has not barked or anything. I'm so proud of her. Uh, but she's a she's a big dog. Um, she's a Rottweiler. And um, let's I don't do this, but let's assume for just a moment that I let her out in the front yard to go to the restroom, right? Um, and then one day my neighbor comes over and uh, knocks on my front door, and I open my door, and my neighbor says, "You need to keep that dog inside." And I'm like, "Nope." Like, you're not going to tell me what to do with my dog or my property. No, just no, right? I'm going to keep my dog outside. And those two things, keep your dog inside or keep the dog outside, those are actions. And they are mutually exclusive. 
unless my dog has learned how to break the laws of physics and be in two places simultaneously, she will either be inside or outside. Those two things cannot coexist, right? So when we frame them as actions, I need you to keep the dog inside. No, that's not a need. That's an action. I need the dog to go outside. Nope, that's not a need. That's an action. When we express them as actions, they can be mutually exclusive. If we truly express them as needs, we'll find that they're rarely mutually exclusive. What do I need? Well, I don't need my dog to go outside. I need for my, my dog to be able to use the bathroom in a sanitary manner. That's what I need, right? My neighbor does not need for me to keep the dog inside. My neighbor needs to feel safe. And seeing an unleashed Rottweiler in your front yard can make people feel kind of scared. And I get that, right? So that's the difference. Can we come to an idea or a conclusion to where we can let my dog use the bathroom in a sanitary manner in a way in which my neighbor feels safe? Well, of course we can, right? I bet we can think of tons of different ways that that can happen right now. But the actions are mutually exclusive. The needs are not mutually exclusive. And that's why you need to express them as wants or needs, not as actions. And then the last is to invite your partner to articulate their needs, what do they want, and then brainstorm possible solutions. So I've come up with a couple of scenarios and we're gonna kind of walk through them and we'll be able to identify all four of these steps. So literally you would sit down with your supervisor or your colleague or whomever it is you're having a conversation with and you would say this. Oh, I'm sorry. So these are the sentence stems and then we're going to fill them in and, and look at a couple of scenarios. The sentence stems would be, thank you for meeting with me. Describe the problem in objective terms using I language. This is a problem for me because now whenever you see brackets that you fill your own stuff in there, right? Don't, don't sit down with your supervisor and say, this is a problem for me because reason. That, that, that's not going to go well. You actually need to fill in the reasons yourself. Okay, So fill in what the reasons are and say, I need, and then detail what your needs are. Again, not actions. And say, what are your needs in this situation? And what can we do to, to ensure that both of us get what we need? So using these stems, let's take a look at what a conversation might look like. Okay? Uh, Let's say that you've been asked to stay late. You can sit down with your supervisor and say, uh, thank you for meeting with me. Twice in the past month, I have been given projects that required me to stay late in order to complete them by the deadline. This is a problem for me because I have to pick up my daughter from school at 530 and I have to be home to let the dogs out. I need to ensure that my daughter is picked up safely and the animals don't have an accident in the house. What are your expectations for last minute projects and what can we do to be sure we both get what we need? Okay, so you'll notice it is twice in the past month I've been given project. That is a descriptive term. I am objectively saying I was twice given projects that had, had me stay late. Now, this is also when I say have some notes or documentation or whatever, because they might be, they don't even remember, right? This was a thing they didn't, they'll be like, wait, when did that happen? You'll say, well, it was the, the TPS uh, reports that I had to have turned in uh, last February 12th or whatever it might be. So if you actually can have the documentation or be able to tell them when it was, because that, when I said anticipate questions your supervisors might have, that would be an example of a question, right? When did that, when did that happen? Um, then this is a problem for me. Again, descriptive. This is what I have to do. Don't say, now this is that need action thing in this third part. Don't say, I have to pick my daughter up at 5.30. Now, the reality is you don't have to pick your daughter up at 5.30. That's not what you need. That is an action, not a need. The need is your daughter needs to be picked up safely. Let's assume for a moment that your supervisor is willing to shell out and pay for an Uber for your daughter. That might meet your need, right? She might be picked up safely and be taken home. Make sense? So we don't want to... That's one of the problems is, oh, goodness, I was bragging on her about not barking, and there she goes. Um, uh, we, we don't want to foreclose possible solutions that we can come up with and brainstorming um, by doing action. So we'll express needs, and then who knows what might come up in the brainstorming, okay? 
I'm going to give you one more scenario as well. And this next one, well, well I'll talk about it afterwards. So th here's the other one. Um, I call this the coffee keeper. So you sit down with your supervisor and you say, thank you for meeting with me. I understand that as the first one in, Jason used to make coffee in the morning. Now that Jason no longer works here and I'm the first one here in the morning, I feel as though the expectation is for me to make the coffee. When I don't make the coffee, I feel as though people are judging me and I've overheard comments that makes me feel unappreciated. This is a problem for me because I don't drink coffee. Being responsible for brewing the coffee falls outside of my job description and I use the first hour of my shift to prepare the office for students who may come in when we're open. Uh, I need to know that the responsibilities and expectations for my position are ensure they match the written job description, and ensure the office is always ready to serve our students. What do you need and what can we do to be able to meet both of our goals? And the reason I bring this up is because for some of you, you might be saying, dude, whatever, just make the coffee. Like, it's not a big deal, right? What do you got to do? You got you to get some water and you got to put it in the pot and you're just kind of done. And the reason why I like this one is it's because I can't tell you what is worthy of a conversation with your supervisor. Only you can make that decision. And you might be saying to yourself, coffee is just not a big deal. Cool. For you, you wouldn't have to have this conversation with your supervisor. But there also might be somebody sitting right next to you right now and say, oh, yeah, tell me about it. They always expect me to make the coffee and it's irritating and now you're mad about it. So my point is, I'm, so I, the reason I like this particular scenario is this goes back to that first slide, which is, do I have to have this conversation? And I can't answer that question for you. The only person who can answer the question for you of, should I have this conversation with my supervisor or my colleague or whomever is you. I can't do it. I can answer that question for myself and you can answer the question for yourself. And so this coffee situation is one where some of you wouldn't care and some of you it would upset. So, but this is also a way that you can, in, you can engage your supervisor with an issue like this to where you explain why it's a problem, especially because your supervisor might be thinking, look, it's no big deal. It's just coffee. You're the first one in. We all like to have a cup. We get in. So can't you just make it? And you're explaining, I understand that's how you feel. But I don't believe that should be my job because of X, Y, and Z. And now the supervisor, y'all will be able to work some things out, right? And it might very well be that guess what? When you come in, you're going to be making the coffee because that's what the supervisor wants. But you might be able to have somebody else do another one of the things you do to get the office ready. So that way students are, when they come, when, at 8 o'clock when the students come in, the office is ready. So the five minutes it takes you to prep the coffee, somebody else takes another one of your responsibilities off your plate and they do that one for you, which frees up that five minutes. Does that make sense? So now you feel appreciated. And even if you weren't able to resolve the conflict such that you don't have to do the coffee, you can resolve the conflict that your time is valued and that it meets your needs, which is to ensure that the office is ready to go at eight o'clock when students come in or whatever it might be. Does that make sense? Cool. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, so just to wrap up, I hope what we've learned or what, what we've, we've kind of started to do today is that I've given you some general sentence stems and some ideas and some approaches that you can utilize when having conversations that can make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, it is perfectly okay to feel that way when going into conversations with someone like your supervisor. Because anytime there's power dynamics in an office where one person has, you know, I mean, we, we talk about they can write you up or they can hire and fire or they can, I mean, any number, responsible for promotions, all those kinds of things. Whenever you have power dynamics in a relationship like that, it can make it scary. It can make it, um, um, uncomfortable for you. But most people respond very well to clear, assertive articulations of issues. And most supervisors want their workers to be happy. 
And one of the things the supervisors don't like is when they come to find out that their employees or the people that they are um, um, supervising are unhappy and they didn't know about it. And they're like, well, let's wait. So everybody's been mad for months about this thing. I didn't even know it was an issue. Like I can fix this in like two seconds if y'all just wouldn't let me know. And a lot of times when you can go into a conversation with your supervisor and you're comfortable and you're confident about it and you can let them know in a, in a respectful and appropriate professional manner, they're actually very appreciative that you come to them and they like having those conversations because they're able to resolve conflicts because nobody wants the work environment to be uncomfortable for anybody. So I hope that this can kind of help you with some stems, find a way to broach and to introduce that concept uh, with your supervisor. And that is the time that I have been allowed. So I would like to thank uh, everybody for uh, inviting me um, and being able to talk with you. And I hope that that was helpful.